Well, welcome everyone, and this is my greatest pleasure to, uh, to introduce today Susanna. Susanna is a very recent PhD graduate working in the laboratory of, of Nicolas Thomas at FMI in Basel, Switzerland. Congratulations, Susanna, to your uh, recent great defense. Uh, she has an avid interest in molecular glue degraders and more generally in understanding how changes in protein interactome can be brought uh, about by the binding of small molecules. Prior to joining the, uh, the Toma lab in late 2018, Susanna obtained an integrated master's degree from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and during uh, her, her studies, she undertook various research projects, including uh, a project with, uh, with Nenad Ban at ATH and Alessio Cooley at the University of Dundee. Susanna and I are, are great collaborators and friends, and, and she, uh, she has made significant effort in researching and understanding the universe of the cycling K molecular glue degraders. We are very much looking forward to your sem seminar, Susanna. Uh, hi, uh, everyone. Thank you very much, Mikoy, for this uh, extremely kind introduction. Uh, and a huge thanks to the entire committee uh, for having me here. Uh, I have been a, an avid follower uh, of this series from the very start, and it's uh, a great privilege to be able to contribute a little bit today uh, by sharing our story of molecular glue degraders of cycling K. Uh, so to provide a, a quick outline, uh, as an introduction in the first few minutes, I will recap our discovery of the initial cycling key degrader, uh, CR8, uh, and then I will share with you uh, unpublished work on new compounds from this class uh, and discuss some of the perhaps uh, more generalizable learnings that um, transpire. And before we get started, um, I'm sure that this audience uh, really needs uh, no introduction to degraders, but just to give a, a few words of uh, context, the projects that I'll discuss today uh, began because we were very excited, um, as um, likely many of you in the audience are, uh, about the prospect of identifying uh, new uh, examples of molecular glue degraders, which are these uh, fascinating uh, small molecules that, as uh, depicted in this cartoon, can leverage uh, complementary protein-protein interfaces uh, to bring together a ubiquitin ligase uh, and a target, leading ultimately to target degradation uh, by the proteasome. Uh, and as the discoveries of molecular glue degraders such as uh, imits uh, or aryl sulfonamides have uh, famously been uh, mostly both serendipitous and retrospective, uh, our aim was to approach this task uh, in a more systematic manner. And uh, for this, uh, we joined forces with uh, Ben Ebers Laboratory here uh, at the Dana Farber, uh, where uh, Mikoy Sobitsky, who of course needs no introduction, had a great idea to um, do this by taking advantage of, of the PRISM project data and evaluating the correlations of drug toxicity uh, and ubiquitin ligase uh, mRNA expression levels across many uh, cell lines. So in this plot you see here, uh, every point corresponds to a different cancer cell line. And we would identify potential degraders by saying that for a particular pair of uh, drug and ligase, uh, the cell lines with high ligase expression are more sensitive uh, to the drug than those with lower ligase levels. And we saw that high expression of DDB1, uh, a calendrin ligase adapter protein, correlated with a high sensitivity to CR8, a preclinical cyclin-dependent kinase or CDK inhibitor, indicating that the mode of action of CR8 is ligase-dependent and, and therefore perhaps degradation-related. Uh, with this, we hypothesized that uh, CR8 uh, targets an essential protein for degradation, uh, and we performed uh, proteomic experiments. These were contributed by uh, Catherine Donovan from uh, Eric Fisher's lab, uh, which indeed found that cyclin K, uh, an activator protein that associates with some CDKs, is strongly depleted uh, following compound treatment. So now to try to figure out how CR8 achieves uh, cyclin K degradation, Mikoy uh, performed two genome-wide uh, CRISPR screens with either um, survival or stability uh, of a fluorescent cycling K reporter as readouts and identified multiple ligase components like CAL4B, uh, RBX1, or DDB1, as well as the kinase CDK12 uh, as required for the activity uh, of CR8. And this was pretty great as it um, reassured us that really a functional ligase is involved, but it also uh, left us uh, a bit puzzled because what we did not find in this process was a substrate receptor. So this really crucial module um, that other molecular glues used to hijack their respective ligases with uh, 
imid activity, of course, strictly dependent on, on CRBN uh, and that of, of aerosulfonamides on DK15. And here, uh, this key piece uh, was missing. And uh, to cut uh, what is a, a very long story uh, short, uh, we were able to finally resolve this through in vitro reconstitutions uh, involving the identified proteins. So, for example, we saw robust uh, drug induced cyclin K ubiquitination in the absence of a substrate receptor, such so as with the core ligase components, um, CR8, cyclin K, uh, and CDK12. And all of this led us to uh, what to me is an even more interesting question of how can, in this case, cyclin K, uh, a neomorphic glue-induced substrate, uh, even bind to the ligase uh, without a substrate receptor? And as uh, we are a structural biology lab, to answer this, we turned uh, to X-ray crystallography. So here's a crystal structure of the ternary complex, and you see here uh, the kinase cyclin heterodimer, then DDB1, the ligase adapter protein with its two WD40 propeller domains. Uh, and here in gray, uh, you see our molecular glue, CR8, that uh, as expected for a kinase inhibitor is bound to CDK12 and sits in its uh, ATP pocket. What is unexpected, however, and really important here is that it also bridges out of the kinase pocket and uh, into DDB1. And this protruding uh, phenylpyridine that we refer to as uh, the gluing moiety contacts several uh, DDB1 residues. Importantly, this arginine here through pi cation interactions. So clearly, uh, it is the, the kinase domain of, of CDK12 that interacts directly with the DDB1 ligase adapter through this very extensive and highly complementary interface, uh, including also this uh, really interesting decaf-like C-terminal feature. And um, in my view, that the structure gives what's a, an really unexpected, but a, quite a beautiful rationale for why no canonical substrate receptor is necessary uh, for this complex to form. So if we now um, compare the whole ligase models for the lenalidomide uh, and CR8 scenarios, you can hopefully appreciate uh, even better that, that CDK12 really functions as a drug-induced uh, substrate receptor, taking the equivalent spot to uh, CRBN here uh, and placing cyclin K uh, in a, a prime position for ubiquitin transfer. Uh, and if we uh, just pause here briefly and take a step back to, to consider more generally uh, and more uh, conceptually perhaps how the graders are designed or rather what uh, should they be designed to, to bring together, uh, I think that the, the CR8 example really nicely illustrates that it um, effectively all boils down to complementary interfaces uh, and to the right geometry for ubiquitin transfer. So for example, we can in principle, like we do here, uh, do something previously unconceivable uh, and entirely bypass a uh, canonical substrate receptor module. Also, uh, like in this case, if the geometry is favorable, we can perhaps recruit our target here, cyclin K, by engaging its interaction partner, CDK12. Uh, and it goes to show that as we gradually discover and structurally characterize uh, new examples, we really can uh, open up uh, new possibilities uh, for the greater development. So uh, having visualized this complex, uh, we also went on to, to probe the underlying binding affinities uh, uh, using two parallel methods. Uh, first with uh, a tr fred assay where we titrate in, in the glue compound and, and follow the coming together of our fluorescently labeled proteins, uh, we measured a, a tight uh, low nanomolar uh, ternary complex affinity. We also probed this complex using a label-free method, uh, ITC, which uh, again confirmed this uh, low nanomolar interaction, but it also uh, revealed that these proteins actually interact with a 50 micromolar affinity uh, in the absence of a glue, which is uh, not so surprising uh, if you look again at their vast uh, complementarity uh, that our structure revealed. But what's uh, crucial here is that the glue still strengthens complex formation a, a, a few thousand fold uh, in a manner that was uh, recently postulated, among others, by, by Ning Cheng's lab, to be common amongst many molecular glues. Uh, and thereby, the glue actually works to push this interaction uh, over the threshold uh, to a cellular phenotype. So to wrap up this uh, first part of my talk, uh, I would like to reiterate that CR8 is uh, not just a competitive kinase inhibitor uh, that can block an ATP pocket with uh, this purine core, but also a molecular glue degrader. And this uh, degrader activity that is mediated by uh, this phenylpyridine moiety that points into DDB1 yields a, a robust and, and importantly selective inactivation of CDK12 through the degradation uh, of its co-activator cyclin K. 
So the effect is we end up with this unique hybrid molecule with essentially two parallel lives. Uh, so CR8 can bind to different CDKs uh, and achieve their inhibition, but only binding to CDK12 uh, will result in a generation of a compatible enough interface for ubiquitin ligase recruitment uh, and trigger cytokine K degradation. Uh, and from the point of um, therapeutic targeting of CDK12, this is really interesting because the notorious issue with, with existing inhibitors is their lack of selectivity. Activity. And here we have a molecule that in at least one aspect of its mechanism, and importantly a catalytic one, is a CDK12 selective. Now, um, on to the second chapter, uh, which begins with the fact that uh, very shortly after we published the CR8 story, uh, more compounds able to degrade cycling K were reported by the Winter, uh, Han, and Glim laboratories. And when we looked at, at all these molecules that you see here, what we were really surprised by was uh, how chemically different those were from, from CR8. And, and really, the main question we had was, could they even work uh, via the same mechanism and interface? Uh, and this to me is uh, interesting also in the context of a much more fundamental question uh, perhaps of what kind of structure activity relationship um, should we expect uh, for the glue modality? Uh, for the previous uh, two classes, the consensus seemed to be a, an inherently steep SAR, uh, whereby uh, even a, a small chemical change uh, at this interface can abolish activity, or uh, like in the case of imids, we may recruit an altogether different substrate. Um, however, uh, at this stage, we do not actually have uh, large published studies that would um, systematically assess glue SAR and, and really bring in the wealth of structural data needed to not just understand how different each glue class uh, can really be, but also ultimately to um, help us develop this modality in a less um, serendipitous manner. Uh, and now here, these uh, cycling key degraders really appear to uh, give us a very unique opportunity to dive right into this. So this is what we did uh, with these questions in mind. We uh, set out to investigate uh, if and how diverse compounds can commit cyclin K for degradation, uh, first focusing on the CR8 scaffold uh, and more specifically on dissecting its gluing moiety. Uh, and just to um, orient you here again, CR8 is uh, bound in the active site of CDK12 um, through two classical hydrogen bonds uh, shown here uh, in pink uh, to the kinase hinge. Uh, and uh, it's, it's phenylpyridine uh, gluing moiety bridges over to DDB1 interacting predominantly with this arginine 9 to 8 here via pi cation contacts. So we um, crystallized this ternary complex uh, with different derivatives. And we, for example, saw that swapping this key phenylperidine for a biphenyl actually preserves the same binding mode. Uh, and we see no drop in the uh, tr fred affinity, indicating that this hydrogen bond acceptor here is actually redundant in vitro. Now, um, while a, a phenyl ring uh, on a propyl chain still worked quite well, uh, shortening the uh, chain further to yield roscovidin, uh, more considerably impaired gluing. Um, however, upon this entire, uh, so to speak, gradual simplification exercise, what really uh, struck us the most was that even just uh, an octal chain promoted quite some complex formation. Uh, and this to us really revealed a type of um, anything goes plasticity that is quite distant uh, from the traditional lock and key uh, description of drug target interactions. Uh, and this led us to ask whether uh, just simply uh, filling the kinase pocket with something uh, would suffice. Um, however, this disubstituted core uh, that you see here did not facilitate uh, this interaction, showing that while indeed uh, this ternary complex is uh, surprisingly permissive uh, to ligand changes, some engagement of DDB1 uh, by the compound, even if just via uh, hydrophobic interactions, is required. I um, unfortunately cannot uh, get into our many other CRA derivatives due to uh, limited time, uh, but this plasticity that you just saw uh, prompted us to also look into other um, unrelated scaffolds, uh, such as this published kinase inhibitor here, uh, which we actually show is a cryptic, highly potent glue. Uh, and the one uh, surprising aspect that I would like to draw your attention to here, which 
uh, is, is that we actually here have a, a quite a, a hydrophilic uh, substituent now taking the role uh, of the gluing moiety. Uh, and this, I think, uh, quite nicely uh, illustrates that uh, functionalities beyond just uh, greasy hydrophobic handles uh, that we would normally associate with gluing uh, can also drive complex formation with the help of additional interactions. And now um, moving on to even more dissimilar scaffolds, uh, we nominated this uh, relatively weak uh, biogen CDK12 inhibitor as a, a putative cyclin K degrader based on its um, suspiciously potent uh, reported downstream effects. Uh, and it turns out we were right. And uh, quite strikingly, uh, the structure revealed that this compound, uh, despite its much smaller size, actually yields a, a, an analogous high affinity complex with both the kinase and DDB1 interactions preserved. Uh, and with this, uh, you may realize now that, that this brings us um, a lot closer to these other uh, published cyclin K degraders that initially had us very confused, uh, but made uh, more and more sense uh, as we gradually uh, uncovered the plasticity uh, of this interface. Uh, and we solved structures with uh, many of those, uh, including unpublished compounds uh, kindly shared by the Winter Lab. And this allowed us to, to really hone in on, on the minimal fingerprint uh, of a cyclin K degrader, which uh, comprises a classical kinase hinge interacting acceptor donor motif, which through the hydrogen bone donor then connects to an aromatic gluing moiety. So with all this, we demonstrate that cyclin K degraders are highly diverse. Uh, here you see uh, the molecular weight distribution now of our entire set of glues uh, and a plot of compound similarity to CR8 uh, versus their in vitro uh, activity clearly showing that the best glues marked here uh, are actually all over the similarity spectrum. And um, remarkably, with uh, the almost 30 crystal structures that we have now solved, we show that all of these compounds work principally uh, via the same interface. And we think we can really begin to, to understand this uh, and attribute their unusual diversity to the following factors. So firstly, uh, we have the huge and, and complementary dbb one cdk 12 interface. Then um, the fact that many different moieties can bind the, the feature-rich kinase pocket, as we know very well, of course, from the large kinase inhibitor portfolio, and uh, that many different groups can effectively bridge this interface and engage a DDB1 predominantly, uh, but not exclusively uh, via pi cation interactions. All the while, the compound is still accommodated in this quite large uh, and moldable cavity at the interface. So now um, going a little bit uh, beyond the SAR with this large compound set in hand, uh, we also wanted to explore a little bit uh, cross assay correlations uh, as for example, the, the relationship between um, in vitro ternary complex formation uh, and target degradation is not really so firmly established uh, for the glue modality. Uh, we therefore looked at a correlation of uh, logged TR FRED data and DC50s uh, derived from uh, the, the well-known uh, dual color stability reporter experiments. And we actually saw that across a range of activities at uh, the extent of um, in vitro complex formation is in fact generally predictive of, of cellular degradation. And while there are surely um, some caveats here, and this will likely be a case specific to an extent, I think it gives some reassurance uh, about the relevance uh, of in vitro screening approaches for this modality. And um, finally, with um, the therapeutic utility of, of all these compounds in mind, um, we looked again uh, at their inherent uh, mechanistic duality. As I've shown you a few minutes ago, CR8 is a hybrid molecule that um, inhibits many CDKs, uh, but then only binding to CDK12 recruits the ligase and, and triggers cycling degradation. Um, however, with our uh, large degrader set now, we can actually propose at least two distinct paths to fully selected compounds. One um, is a cyclin K degrader that only inhibits the cyclin's cognate CDKs and hence uh, avoids any off-target effects. And here we have, for example, uh, the highly selective uh, inhibitor uh, SR4A35, uh, which we know uh, and, and now show that it is a very uh, potent uh, cryptic cyclin K degrader. Uh, and we crystallize it at this interface to explain both its inhibitory selectivity uh, and this gain of function. 
Um, now, the second option, quite an attractive one, is a compound acting purely uh, as an interface stabilizer. And among these um, small, almost fragment-sized uh, degraders that, that I showed you a few slides ago, we actually find that, that for example, this um, HQ461 compound shows no CDK inhibition in our assays, indicating um, that the kinase inhibitory and cyclin K degradation activities can be decoupled. And lastly, uh, we asked whether cyclin K degradation is perhaps uh, in any way advantages to, or, or at least different than inhibition uh, of its cognate CDKs. Uh, and to probe this, uh, we performed RNA-seq uh, with a selection of compounds. And we saw that upon a principal component uh, analysis of those data, while a, a bona fide inhibitor and a CDK12 protag that actually spares cycling K clustered together, um, CR8 clearly clustered away, um, indicating that cycling K degraders do have a, a distinct transcriptional profile uh, and hence could perhaps offer uh, unique therapeutic opportunities. Uh, so uh, in place of a summary, uh, in the final minutes, I would like to um, highlight a, a few more general things that we have uh, learned through this work. Um, firstly, uh, the major outcome has been uh, the identification of a new class of molecular glue degraders, uh, including uh, many diverse compounds and a host of ternary complex crystal structures that will hopefully uh, serve as a useful resource. Um, importantly, it's a class that's actually functionally distinct from the other two. Um, in that uh, instead of having a compound binding to, to a ligase substrate receptor, uh, like we have for, for imids or aerosulfonamides uh, and recruiting the degradation target, we have a compound binding on the side of the target and recruiting the core ligase complex directly while entirely bypassing a, a canonical substrate receptor. Now, um, we also learned uh, uh, through many failed assumptions along the way that each molecular glue degrader class is likely to be a little different uh, from the next. Um, a perhaps a useful uh, a general observation we can now make, however, is that the absolute size of the protein-protein interface um, as well as the, the compound's relative contribution to this interface um, appear to govern uh, both the SAR um, and uh, the neosubstrate specificity behavior uh, of a glue. And I'm showing you here uh, uh, two extremes uh, and looking at the thalidomide uh, analog example first, uh, the compound here contributes almost 50% uh, of the total ligase target interface uh, and therefore drives uh, both specificity and affinity with uh, tightly defined SAR. So we have uh, chemically very closely related compounds that degrade different neosubstrates. Now, in contrast, for second key degraders, uh, the much, much larger uh, interface has a huge contribution of uh, DDB1 uh, CDK12 contacts with only around 20% provided by the drug. And this now allows uh, for a, a lot more variability in protein ligand interactions, uh, as we saw, yielding a flatter SAR, uh, but at the same time limiting uh, the compound's contribution to neosubstrate specificity. So we end up on, on the other end of the spectrum with very diverse compounds that all exclusively degrade cycling K. And um, thinking now about how one could actually prospectively attempt to come up with uh, new glue compounds, um, we're unfortunately not there yet, but one, I think, helpful notion uh, comes from the following example. So let's uh, look again at roscovidin, uh, which acts as a, a CDK inhibitor and, and does not degrade uh, cycling K. Now, adding just one pyridine ring um, on the solvent exposed side uh, of this molecule is enough to furnish it with this extraordinary uh, gain of function degrader activity. So while roscovidin binds to CDK12 um, and stops there, CR8 with this one extra ring um, modifies um, the kinase surface enough to recruit to it this um, otherwise unrelated protein complex, which just happens uh, to be a ubiquitin ligase that is perfectly positioned to ubiquitinate uh, cycling K. Uh, and what's exciting is that this um, now outlines a, a less serendipitous approach to search for molecular glues for, for a target of interest, whereby we can modify uh, the solvent exposed parts of, of existing binders and screen, for example, for target destabilization. Um, and of note, uh, this is, of course, echoed in the BCL6 story and the matched BI um, inhibitor degrader pair. Uh, and this very concept of 
modifying binders into glues was, was also recently explored in a, a preprint uh, by the Nomura lab uh, in the context of um, covalent degraders. Uh, and just to finish off uh, with uh, another step back and a more big picture thought about um, interface modulation, uh, we have examples of uh, disease states uh, like sickle cell anemia, where a single point mutant uh, on the hemoglobin surface leads to its uh, polymerization. So essentially, uh, a surface mutation shows this really surprising ability to trigger uh, the novel protein-protein interactions. Now, it becomes quite clear that bound compounds, uh, both drugs and perhaps even endogenous molecules, through their solvent-exposed moieties, modify uh, protein surfaces uh, in an analogous manner, uh, reminiscent of a non-covalent uh, PTM, and therefore can uh, induce new interactions in a way that's uh, a lot more common than what the, at least we have uh, previously thought. And I really hope that um, our dissection uh, of the molecular basis of um, how cycling K degraders can tip this balance towards uh, new interactions uh, uh, can serve as a, a small step uh, forward uh, in this journey towards the prospective identification uh, and design uh, of molecular glue degrader drugs. And with that, uh, I'm at the end of my presentation. I would like to give my big thanks to, to um, everyone involved in this uh, big team effort. Uh, of course, uh, Nico for his uh, guidance and supervision, Dakota, our uh, chief and only chemist, uh, uh, Vivi, a, a master student who contributed a lot of uh, biochemistry uh, uh, during her, her master thesis, uh, Georg was our crystallography expert, and then uh, also Georg and Richard who worked predominantly on the CR8 story, uh, and of course the Ebert lab who were uh, crucial in all this, uh, especially Ben and, and Mikowai uh, who led the effort uh, on this side of the ocean. And I'm also very grateful to, to the uh, Fisher Lab, uh, Winter Lab, all of our other uh, great collaborators. Uh, I would like to also acknowledge my Marie Curie uh, uh, doctoral funding and thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to discuss further uh, now or later in the chat.